All right, gentlemen. What song always takes you back to a particular moment in your lives? Um, you know, it's funny. This is going to sound very sappy. Uh, I had some other answers planned, uh, things I was thinking about, like the fact that I, for whatever uh, gosh darn reason, uh, still remember uh, being nine years old outside of Emerald's Restaurant and Universal City Walk, listening to Walking on the Sun, um, stuff like that. But I was thinking about growing up when you were a kid, when you're a young person, you listen to a lot of songs uh, written about uh, heartbreak and written about, uh, you know, breakups, things like that. And you don't really know what that is. You know, you don't know how to process that emotion. I always think it's weird uh, that we we ask kids to read books that they can't possibly understand. No, uh, no junior high school student is going to understand the, why Jay Gatsby is doing what he's doing. And I, as a young person, you know, in high school, I got really into Bob Dylan. That was when I discovered Dylan. And I, I loved some of his angrier songs. I loved Maggie's Farm. I loved Positively Fourth Street, things like that, Um, because I was an angry little teenager. Uh, And I appreciated the music on Blood on the Tracks, which is his famous breakup album. But I didn't get it, really. Um, And I remember it was the end of high school. I hadn't even started going to college yet. It was my senior year. And uh, the girl that I was dating senior year, who... I guess we, we had thoughts at the time of like, oh, we're going to be together forever. But of course you're not. She was going away to college. And I was a fuck up back then. And we were sitting together. Uh, I remember this video, we were sitting on a bench in the park nearby. And we, she broke up with me. You know, she was like, I, you know, I went away for the summer. I went to Paris. And I don't, I don't want to do this anymore. And I had already decided like too. I was like, yeah, we're growing apart. But I guess I did, you know, it was one of those things where just the moment hit really hard. And as I was walking away, at walking out of the park, I had uh, that CD on me, because it was back in the days of CD players. I put that in my Walkman and listened to the song Simple Twist of Fate by, by Dylan's, I think the second track of Blood on the Tracks. And the opening lines uh, were, they sat together in the park as the evening sky grew dark. She looked at him and he felt a spark tingle to his bones was then he felt alone and wished that he'd gone straight brought on by a simple twist of fate and it was just that moment where i think being 17 uh i finally felt this feeling of like i get what this is about i understood a twinge of regret in that song and i swear to you to this day because it was just the lyrics lined up with that moment i listened to that song and it's not like this was some tumultuous love affair uh, in, in my life or anything like that, I, you know. But I just, I hear that song and I remember being 17, sitting on a bench in a park as, as the sun's going down and this, this girl breaking things off and just feeling that, that despair in a way that I guess I, you know, you, you don't really feel when you're younger. This sense of like, oh, it's really over, especially because it's sunk up with graduating high school and, and, and moving on to college and meeting a whole new group of people. Just that, that finality of it. And so now, I love Blood on the Track. It might be my favorite Bob Dylan album, but that song is just every time a goddamn gut punch because of that. Okay, so with me, I didn't grow up with a particular sense of music in my life. My parents weren't much into music uh, so I didn't really have much of that. Whatever I got was kind of in fits and drabs and um, really mainly came from other media. All my connections to music comes from like what I heard in a movie or from a video game and all those connections from that. So um, I could very easily say, um, you know, there's like a uh, fucking hundred songs that I could name and they instantly shoot me back to. 2002 in my room that I shared with my little brother playing Grand Theft Auto Vice City. Um, you know, Billy Jean, Dance Hall Days, I Ran, all all sorts of stuff like that. Um, but there's one song in particular that I connect to that every time I hear it and it's it's like the one song from this band that I I even have and I keep every time I get a new phone or iPod or what have you, I put it on my uh, my in in my music and it's because it just it just transports me back to senior year of high school where 
um i started coming out of my shell my uh uh, my brother was finally in prison so I could finally stop living in fear all the time. And I was coming out and having, making friends and going out with people. And this was when this is at the height of Guitar Hero. And the amount of times me and my friends hung out, be it with alcohol or without alcohol, uh, watching my one friend. I mean, we'd all try, but one friend who was the best at Guitar Hero really try to what was it? Five star, Kyle? What, what's like the highest ranking you can get? Like five stars, oh, I think. Yeah. Are you talking about like what? 100% gold on expert? Something like that. Yeah. Watching my friend trying to do that on uh, Through the Fire and Flames by Dragon Force. Yep. Like it's not like a particularly great song or anything, but I always put it on in my music uh, app on my phone because it's just every time I hear it, I'm sent right back to my bedroom or my living room or my friend's living rooms, wherever we were on a certain weekend in senior year of high school, summer of co- summer in going into college of us just hanging around playing a uh, guitar hero. And it's really tinged with a lot of fucking bittersweet emotions and melancholy because uh, it just reminds me of better days more innocent days i should say not even so much a case of oh back when the future was ahead of us and everything could like you know the possibilities were endless it's not so much that like whatever we're 30 and like my life's not a fucking train wreck or anything it's so much that there was like 11 of us 13 of us something like that and including me like three or four that didn't succumb to trumpism and this neo-nazi way of living that I now don't talk to most of these guys. The only ones I talk to are the ones that didn't succumb to it. And just remembering the days before my friends were poisoned by suburban life and the suburban victim mentality that has been bred into everyone that doesn't leave this goddamn area that is the suburbs of, of New York. And I think back to this frankly ridiculous fucking heavy metal song. And all of the time we all spent trying to fucking five star this stupid thing on a stupid game that doesn't even exist anymore, basically. And I just remember so many things like it was yesterday, some good, some bad. And but still all of it tinged with like almost like being a fucking veteran or something and like remembering all of the guys that I that aren't around anymore because they aren't the guys I grew up with. Like when I cut ties with them, they were poisonous hateful people and they were not the the men i knew and i don't know i i keep it going all the time to remember those days and to remind myself like i could have easily been like them i could have fallen like them um and to just remind myself that i was like things are better for me in terms of my personal life and i've grown out of my shell and everything and um to never just give up that things will always get better if you put the effort in and so bringing it down uh, bringing the vibes down man uh it's, it's, not, it's, it's not like my answer was particularly upbeat uh <laughs> yeah but i brought neo-nazis into it it's true so fucking through the fire and flames by <laughs> dragon force it elicits all of this nonsense so if you don't stick around until the end of the episode you'll regret it Maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow, but soon and for the rest of your life. That's because we're talking 1942's Casablanca here on You're Missing Out with special guest Brian DiLorenzo. Our guest today is the writer and director of the new film Myth, currently on Amazon Prime. Brian DiLorenzo joins us today to talk about Casablanca. Brian, thank you so much for joining us. Hey, thanks, guys. I'm, I'm pumped to be here. I'm so glad that you came by, and uh, I'm so glad to get to speak to you. There, We've known each other for... God, do we dare say the number? Uh, over a decade now, uh, in one point or another. Um, you, me, and Tom all know each other from back in our film school days. You were, you know, we were all film majors, but also you were the editor of the entertainment section of our college newspaper before I was. You were the person who, who preceded me there, and if it weren't for you, I certainly wouldn't have been involved in that, and not to mention uh, Tom. He, the first ever uh, writing he had published in a publication is thanks to you. Oh, wow. Uh, this is yeah. very crazy. Yeah. So, thank you, buddy. <laughs> it's, I, it, I, 
I love the, you know, I have so many good memories from that, from that era. Um, just working with you guys and like staying up till like, you know, midnight talking about like lost or debating some, you know, I, I was running at the time there was an art and literature magazine on campus and apparently the art and literature magazine and the newspaper had a rivalry going back decades. Um, <laughs> which I hadn't parted on me my freshman year and then sophomore year, I ended up just following uh, a, a girl to the <laughs> informational meeting uh, at the newspaper. I met, you know, met you. We started talking, and immediately I was like, oh, "All right, let's do this." And it, you were so cool with so many different uh, ideas. You you let us dedicate an entire issue to Martin Scorsese. You challenged me that there was nothing I could write that you wouldn't print, uh, <laughs> yeah, which is an ongoing <laughs> an ongoing uh, affair. Um, I think you won. I, I, by the way. Yes, I. Well, no, I didn't because I. I wrote a piece. Uh, this is so. I wrote a piece that was so uh, <laughs> angry and obscene because I started on the paper writing. Um, you had me doing these pieces that were like I would write. It was like a point counterpoint, and I would pick some pop culture thing that everybody liked, and I would say why it sucked, and somebody <laughs> yeah. else would say why it was good. And I wrote one that was so angry and obscene that you originally said, I couldn't, you know, you, you finally backed down and went, I can't print this. You're right. I can't print this. And then your last issue, you did a word jumble. Do you remember this? You did it. You published a word jumble wherein it contained every word of that piece. So you were able to tell me you technically printed it. Oh, my God. Yeah. <laughs> I remember that. It was- um. <laughs> it was like it was it was the perfect baller move to end your time at a college newspaper. It's just to go, yeah, I did it. Fine. Here's here's all these obscene words hidden in a word jumble. <laughs> then we were almost sued by uh, LL Cool J for yes running yeah. an article. <laughs> that well, was that fun. that wasn't us, thankfully. That was the news section, right? That's right. Yeah, we, we dodged the bullet there. We and no, we didn't get into trouble with it with the newspaper staff <laughs> until after you left and I took over and I I got us kicked out of the newspaper. Yeah, for we had publishing a it. Talk about LL Cool J. <laughs> <laughs> so so that was that, and then uh, you know we all made films in college, and I remember after college you I think it was very shortly after college you started uh, planning this film Myth. Um. Mm-hmm. It's been a long time passion for you, this this film, right? Yeah. Um, you know, I graduated in 2010, so it's crazy. It's already been like 10 years. But, um, yeah, I was, you know, just like everyone else, like trying to find some, some work after school had ended. And um, I was definitely like ready to, uh, to make another movie. But, you know, it, it just takes so much effort. And um, luckily, you know, we still have like a good group of, of you know, mostly people from – from school that, you know, we went to school with, um, that were willing to like help out and, and be a part of it. So it took a good, you know, five, six years to just kind of put it all together. And I, I was saying to you off mic, I remember seeing on Facebook, uh, you posting the fundraising for it. And then I kind of, I, I kind of got off Facebook, uh, for a while and I, I didn't see anything about it. And then sure enough, I think last year, um, you were doing a promotional appearance for the finished product on, um, on chatting with Asta, Asta parodies his show or web show, which I watch anyway. And then I saw you on there, blew my mind, uh, small world stuff. And I just got so excited. I was like, he, he fucking did it. Oh my God, <laughs> that rules. Wow. Uh, so I, I immediately went to Amazon prime, uh, immediately watched it. And, uh, it, it's, it's one of those cases, uh, as I was telling you before, where <laughs> most often when somebody from film school, uh, makes a film and you watch it. If you feel like you've got to watch it a second time, that normally means they don't, you know, they didn't make it clear. But in this case, Myth is really the kind of film that I, I felt I watched it the first time and I was, I was drawn and I really enjoyed it. But I feel like I have to watch it again just to kind of see how, how, how it all comes together. It's, it's uh, without giving too much away about the film, because uh, it's so much, it's, it's so much fun if you don't know, if people don't know uh, really much about it. Uh, right. To kind of play along and try and follow, like what, where is, where is this going? What direction is this going in? Which is, I know, a terrible way to to, pr- to promote a film by not saying anything about it. But it's, I, I'm really excited to dive back into that one again. Well, thank you, man. That's a huge honor. Um, you know, and I know you, how deeply you guys think about film, and you know, for me, it's just like 
just trying to <laughs> just trying to make anything, you know, and, and complete it. But um, uh, but yeah, you know, a lot of like influences there, and you know, the sort of meta world of of you know a film within a film, that kind of that kind of stuff that we played with. But because um, I know that you know you know we we all kind of like love some of the same films, like you know Charlie Kaufman films and, and things like that. So a lot of that plays into it too. I, I'm so, and, and also, you know, as somebody who remembers me back in college, you also know that uh, if I didn't like something, I uh, I was vocal about it. So yes. I'm yes. certainly, <laughs> uh, much to my detriment, I did not uh, keep my uh, opinions to myself. So you can you can know that it's sincere when I say it. Uh, <laughs> Absolutely, you know, that's a that's a great thing. No, I mean, got got to keep it real out there. <laughs> Uh, that's you know that's 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 us here on you're missing out always always keeping it real um but of course you know i i i wanted you to come on the show and i i wanted to come on for something because again i want to make sure people know about your film and I wanna, so i wanted to bring you on for something that we knew people would want to check out one of the big films so i offered you casablanca and lo and behold you told me that you had not uh seen it before which made me even more excited to have you come on and, and join us to talk about it yes i was I got to say a little intimidated because, you know, you're talking about like kind of like one of the cornerstones of film uh, history. And um, I was over the weekend, I was trying to prep for this, the show. And, and I was like, Oh my God. I, <laughs> first of all, I was like, why did I start doing this now? Like I, <laughs> I should have been like researching for weeks because there's just like so much there, um, which I'm sure we'll get into in the show. But, but, um, but yeah, it's, 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 an amazing film and i you know pumped to be uh, talking about it today <laughs> well <laughs> before you know first to start us off uh let's talk about why the national film registry picked the film so this is what the registry had to say about casablanca one of the most beloved of american films this captivating romantic adventure directed by michael curtiz is the story of a world-weary ex-freedom fighter humphrey bogart who runs a nightclub in Casablanca during the early part of World War II. Despite pressure from the local authorities, led by the wily Captain Renault, Claude Rains, Rick's Café has become a haven for refugees. One of those refugees is Rick's true love, who deserted him when the Nazis invaded Paris, Ingrid Bergman, and her resistance leader husband, Paul Heinrich. How the triangle would resolve itself wasn't known even to cast members until the last days of filming. Though often lacking logical cohesion, the film's dialogue and the timelessness of world events swirling around Casablanca made the eventual Best Picture winner a favorite with wartime audiences. So that's what the registry had to say. I'm going to throw something out there. The lacking logical cohesion line is weird. Not sure where that comes from. Um, <laughs> that's a bit... Like... I think... um because I did have this one thought watching it, because it's been a bit since I've seen mm -hmm. it. I saw it the first time, I think, in, either in college or sometime after college. So I was grown when I saw it first time. But watching it this time, I did just keep, like, they kept trying to explain it away, but I just kept saying, well, just fucking kill him. Yeah, no, 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 don't get me wrong. There's, there, I, I do agree, and, and uh, I was listening to Roger Ebert's commentary on the film from the two discs that Warner Brothers put out, and there's certainly logical flaws. What I'm saying is more... <laughs> Sometimes when you find these registry statements, there's sentences in there where it's like, why are you saying this? Like, um, <laughs> we're going to get to it in a future season, but I swear to God, their write-up for My Man Godfrey ends with, uh, with them going, do not confuse this with the terrible 1956 uh, David Niven version. And I'm just like, why are you saying this? You're the Library of Congress. Why are you catty? Well, at least it feels like in this case, it, I mean, it's like the thing we've, we've talked about this shit before with some movies. And I mean, like, I know this is a movie that had one of those kind of productions where you go, how the hell did this even like come together oh, yeah. and work where you can just like say, like, it's not that there's many flaws in this movie, but there's like that one big gaping floor of just like, well, just kill the guy. You're Nazis. And to be clear, there's another thing and like i said roger ebert points it out which you know not not to front load this but i've watched this movie many times i grew up with this film i love this film um you know and i feel like i also as all of us i think do i think we all know this film before we even saw it because 
it pops up in so many Looney Tunes things and so many, you know, if you went to Disney MGM Studios as a kid, it's on the ride and they lie and tell you they have the actual plane there, which way they 100% did not. And it's just um, a movie that characters in other movies watch all the time. Yeah. And, and you just get so much of it. But, like, I, I think it's just one of those cases that, like, in the statement, it's just, like, okay, there may be, like, a big floor or two that might get some of you, like, literal-minded, you know, yeah. Twitter scolds get up in, a, up in a uproar. But, like, this movie's so great in spite of its nightmare production and frankly these flaws and like also just the entire like mcguffin is just not a, a real thing <laughs> yeah and well that's the thing it's but so what struck me about it is not even about the statement it's an accurate statement but tom you know we've read enough of these now where they're so kind of cut and dry like here's facts that every once in a while when they editorialize it just throws you for a loop well, it feels like the whoever um, whoever had to write this statement was like probably one of the people that didn't vote for Casablanca like one of our, like someone we would have probably had as a professor at film school who's just like, well, you know what? Casablanca is actually bad. You know what's really good? This obscure Hungarian movie that's a Casablanca knockoff. And I'm like, okay, guy, really? Uh, maybe they maybe they preferred Casablanco, the the um, Cabo uh, Blanco. Cabo Blanco, the Charles is it Charles Bronson? Of course, it's Charles. The Bronson. shitty the shitty Charles Bronson remake. Listen, because when you. Because when you think of a good replacement for Humphrey Bogart, your first thought goes to, hey, I'm Charles Brinson. I'm going to fight the Nazis. Oh, my God. Yeah, uh, this is... <laughs> there's, there's... Oh, Brian, you have no idea the amount of... So there was there was Cabo Blanco with uh, Charles Bronson. They also attempted a remake called Havana with Robert Redford in, like, the 90s. There have also been two television versions. There was uh, a version in the 50s and then a version in the 80s attempting to make a TV show out of Casablanca. And I have not been able to track down the 80s one, but the 50s one I watched an episode of and it's um, one of the most interminable things I ever sat through, which is fascinating. And that's what makes this film so interesting. And to what they're saying in the statement about logic, lack of logical cohesion, this is a fascinating thing because some of the films we've covered that are classics, you know, this this first year of the registry, almost all the films are the the canonical classics, right? You know, this yeah. first year we've done Star Wars, we've done Gone with the Wind, we've done uh Sunset Boulevard. All films that essentially had an air of importance to them from start to finish. You know, Gone with the Wind, everybody knew what that was going to be when they were making it. Uh, people had their doubts about Star Wars, of course, but it was still this expensive production. What's so fascinating about Casablanca is it's a canonical, you know, canonical film. It's one of the greatest films ever made. No one seemed to think that as they were making it. Um, no. This was this was a an afterthought. Um, Ingrid Berg, but apparently till the day she died, was surprised that people even remembered Casablanca because she was spent all of the production of Casablanca thinking about how she was about to go shoot for whom the bell tolls, which she thought was going to be her big movie. <laughs> so this movie is, and you know, and, and as people have talked about, this was a movie that was being written on the fly. You know, when they went in to pitch it at the, you know, to the studio, they didn't have an ending. Um, when they were made, you know, this was so out, out of control. When this film was first announced, the only reason they announced it at all was because Warner Brothers was put out a press release saying Ronald Reagan was going to star just because they wanted Ronald Reagan's name in the paper again. He was never considered for the role, but they were just using it as like, ah, pick a movie we've got coming out. Casablanca, fine. We'll say he's in it so that we can get Reagan's name in print again, uh, which please imagine this movie with Ronald Reagan in the lead. What a, what a fucking nightmare that would have been. Probably wouldn't have ended up being, uh, you know, one of the greatest films of all time. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's, it's fascinating. But so, yes, yeah, so as we were indicating, it's, it's a, it's a weird case and they've tried to replicate it since with the TV shows with Cabo Blanco and no one has been able to do it. It's a weird thing where everything just sort of fell into place so perfectly on this and it, sh it should not have worked and it, it endures. Uh, it's, which is uh, it's lightning in a bottle. I mean, it's just, it's. Uh, you know, 
we did um this isn't bogart's like first movie i mean we 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 no. dealt with his kind of big coming out uh with like the maltese falcon but this feels like the kind of movie that wouldn't have worked if this was like five years later in bogart's career and he was humphrey bogart and you can i don't know you kind of need to have a bit of a distance from this guy it's funny you mention that topic because what's interesting about bogart part of the reason bogart's in this film because he was not the first choice first choice was supposed to be someone we've talked about in another episode which is did you do you know who i'm talking about tom no you're gonna i think you're gonna find this interesting it was george raft who you might remember uh from a previous episode where we did some like it hot interesting the 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 bad guy from some like it hot yeah. Was supposed to be it. Part of the reason we have Humphrey Bogart in the role is because uh, you remember back when we did an, uh, Maltese Falcon, we talked about that movie Dead End. Yeah. Which was like, you know, Humphrey Bogart's breakout. Well, Bogart and the Dead End kids, which are the kids from that movie, all get signed to a contract with Warner Brothers uh, and they get put in a James Cagney vehicle called Angels with Dirty Faces, which if either of you guys have, have not seen, wild movie great movie james cagney pat o'brien playing like uh two kids that grew up together one becomes a priest one becomes a hoodlum and bogart plays uh a crooked lawyer in the film angels with dirty faces in 1938 is directed by michael curtiz so curtiz really saw what bogart could do so he was already in bogart's corner and by the time Bogart breaks, you know, with Maltese Falcon, Curtis is already in the pocket for this guy. They're willing to take a chance on this guy. And that's how you end up with Bogart in Casablanca, which I think is so interesting. Is that also the, uh, the inspiration for uh, Angels with Filthy Souls, the, uh, the movie within a movie in, in Home Alone? Yes, absolutely. All of those old gangster films uh, are, are so present in those uh, in the. Uh, oh, my God. Why am I forgetting the line? Uh, here, keep the change, you filthy animal. Yes, yeah. that's the that's the quote. Yes, yeah, it's it's all like based on those old gangster films. And in fact, uh, there was concern about putting Bogart in this film uh, about how people might perceive him as a gangster, which is why there were specific instructions that he couldn't wear a hat for the majority of the movie. They thought if he was wearing a hat, he would look too much like a gangster. So that's why he's mostly <laughs> mostly hatless in the film. So you've got him, you got Ingrid. The interesting thing is most of the cast of this film is actually uh, real immigrants and refugees, too. Yeah. There's very few uh, natural-born Americans in this film, which I think adds such a great flavor to it and makes Bogart feel like more of an outsider. Oh, absolutely. And, I mean, it uh, definitely brings some flavor and, and really brings out the emotions in the, uh, the what's the song, where they're singing at the end in the bar and they're trying- Lamar sang. Yeah, where they're drowning out the Nazis from singing, and oh my god, so many of these um, extras and these supporting characters were refugees, so they got all swept up in the moment, and uh, it adds to it. Which also to bring it back to the nightmare <laughs> logic nonsense of the making of this movie, the scene where fucking Bogart nods his head and says, "Yeah, it's okay to to play the song." He he didn't know what he was actually doing in that shot. They just said, "Come to the set, nod." and yeah just leave and he's like um okay and yeah so they were kind of just uh kind of just putting this shit together and uh with uh duct tape and spit uh yeah. i mean even the set the reason we all think about the cinematography of this movie and those incredible shadows right mm-hmm. the reason that those shadows are there is that the sets looked so cheap that if you lit them the way that a hollywood movie would light a set they would look like obvious uh set pieces and also, Rick's Cafe was the only set they built. Yeah. Everything else was just leftovers uh, they had on this on the lot. So, yeah, it, it's fascinating. And um, I do want to say, uh, you know, in terms of the other people they have in there. First off, let me say one thing. And I, I hate to put this uh, episode in a particular point in time, because obviously we're recording it now. It'll be released much later. I have to just acknowledge, when I watched Casablanca to first take notes... I did so um, this past Friday, which was uh, two days after uh, the, or three days, um, no, two days after the the horrific uh, uh, attack on the U.S. Capitol uh, by Nazis. 
and uh, I had been having a real hard time the last couple of days uh, processing that because it's a it's a traumatic event. And the scene where they start singing Le Marseille, uh, I just noticed that I had started crying, <laughs> profoundly crying. Uh, and I realized, like, right, this... I, and it was great because I kind of just got the sense of, like, man, imagine how this must have felt. Imagine how that Le Marseille scene must have felt in 1942, watching that in the theater. You know, it's yeah, easy to... During World War II, right? Yes, yeah, that's... The script, I believe, was written... The original play was written, I believe, pre-Pearl Harbor. Yeah. Um, but when yeah. they pitched it to the studio, it was like a week after. Well, it was actually in, like, in the studio, basically. And after Pearl Harbor, like, one of the readers was like, well, wait a minute, let's let's pull this thing out, and I think it's a good time for it now. And they, uh, Warner Brothers kind of agreed, and, uh, kind of half-assed the making of this movie and accidentally stumbled into a classic because uh, they wanted some uh, World War II content. It's, it's yeah, and, um, but I so... I guess there was a... Uh, oh, sorry. No, guys. please, go right ahead. Oh, I, I guess there was another film called, like, Algiers. Al yes. That um, pre preceded it, and... Um, I guess that was like a hit for them. So they were like, oh, we need more exotic films. So, you know, they started on like with maybe like just Casablanca being like an exotic European thing for them, which, you know. Because the, the play that it's based on is called Everybody Comes to Rick's. And they yeah. retitled it Casablanca thinking, well, it'll get the people who saw Algiers in. Yeah. I don't. I've never seen that film. I don't know if it's still, if that one's still around or not. But obviously, you know, Casablanca <laughs> eclipsed it. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, and it's so fascinating too. I think with this movie, uh, for a movie that was kind of brushed off, so many people in it are integral to film history. Um, one thing I didn't realize until this viewing, and I feel very silly, uh, but you know, I watched a lot when I was a kid. Um, Major Strasser the the nazi in the film did either of you guys happen to catch who that was yeah conrad v conrad v who most people would probably know as cesare in the cabinet of dr caligari yep oh, wow. the somnambulist in dr caligari and then even um even the the croupier emile the guy who's dealing the cards um that's marcel dalio who was in um two of jean renoir's uh, greatest films, Grand Illusion and Rules of the Game. And now here he is in America playing, uh, you know, the the eighth most important character in the movie, if even. Oh, and Conrad Veet came to America because he was very loudly anti-Nazi and uh, the Nazis were coming to kill him and he yeah, had well, to escape. <laughs> his wife was Jewish, I believe. Yeah, and, uh, and he I was think that's why very... Yeah loudly like loudly anti-nazi and uh when he came to america he put it in his contract that i'm just always going to play villains because i want people to just instinctively hate nazis i don't yeah. want to i don't want to have any good portrayals of germans right now so just uh only nazis only bad guys so everyone says fuck the nazis <laughs> what a sacrifice yeah that i mean you know <laughs> it's I am german <laughs> It's so fast. I mean, you know, again, there's so many people in this thing, you know. I mean, half uh, the cast of Maltese Falcons in it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, and I think that's so interesting, too, um, that you've got, you know, when people think of this film, uh, when they parody some Looney Tunes parodies this film, you know, so many times, they even did a full remake called Carrot Blanca in the 90s. And, you know, there's always imitations of Peter Lorre and Sidney Greenstreet and you kind of forget how little they're actually in the movie, considering how often they get brought up with regard to the film. Yeah. You know, Green Street's only got, what, two scenes, and Laurie is gone. He's killed, like, ten minutes in. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He, he, was, he blew my mind. Like, when I, you know, was watching it, like, I immediately, my mind went back to, like, you know, nine, like, cartoons from when I was, like, a little kid, I'm like, oh, yeah, that's the Looney Tunes guy. <laughs> you can just tell by, like, the voice and, like, his face is just so distinctive. But, uh, yeah, he, didn't, he isn't 
he's not in the film for that long. No, and it's it's so funny because uh, the thing that cracks me up with the movie, I guess, is um, you know obviously this became a movie that was an important part of almost all of the stars' legacies. Uh, you know, it's the movie that Bogart heard about the most, uh, that Bergman heard about the most, uh, all that. You know, even if you had a minor role in this movie, you were known for it forever, with the exception of the man who is arguably the third lead, Paul Heinrid, who apparently hated making the movie, uh, didn't want to take the role. Uh, Pauline Kael said it basically labeled him as a stiff forever. He had, and, and no one talks about him. <laughs> He's the only way he's he's so non-existent in this movie, uh, despite being billed third. He's, you never think of Victor Laszlo, you know. Well, it's uh, I guess it's kind of the thing of just being just a pure old nice guy with no other dimensions other than I'm just a good guy who's going to stick it to the Nazis is not as dimensional as, uh, you know, the guy who can't go back to America for some undefined reason and keeps uh running guns for fucking revolutions and is now hiding out in Casablanca with a his own bar and just you know he's kind of a sleazy shit who hangs out with a sex criminal police chief and uh yeah he's just a nice guy he's a good dude there's not much to him than that yeah i and it's funny you mentioned the quote unquote sex criminal police chief because, uh, you know, uh, Brian, I know you said you hadn't seen this before, and Tom, you had seen it before, but when when was the first time you saw it? Oh, boy. I mean, uh, well, it's pre letterboxed so uh, probably like around 2013 or something. I, didn't log- I don't have it logged in before yeah. this rewatch. Uh, so it's funny, because I didn't really know or have any connection to Claude Rains at that time. So like I just didn't even know he was in it when I was sit when I was sitting down to watch it this week, and between my universal horror binge I've been doing with so much Claude Rains and then having Mister Smith goes to Washington, uh you know in this season of the show it's like a lot of Claude Rains and uh, yeah he's he, he's not afraid to really play uh bad guys. <laughs> well, what I find so funny is I grew up with this film. I couldn't tell you the first time I watched it because I just. It was one of those things where it came up so often in, like I said, Looney Tunes parodies and then in the great movie ride and Disney. And there's so many different references to it that I just it was this thing that as a kid I had to see. So I grew up with this film. um, I knew the beats because I watched it when I was a little kid. uh, I certainly did not get the implications that Claude Rains was um, uh, making women uh, have sex with him in exchange for freedom. So as a result, I never remember that part. <laughs> so every time I watch it, I'm always struck by how explicit that is. You know what else I'm is very striking? He's 53 in this movie. Jesus, is he really? Yeah, he was born in 1889. How how was he alive to make Lawrence of Arabia? Well, he you watch Lawrence of Arabia and he looks like he's not that much alive because he died like 2 years later. Wow. Oh my god. I always think of um Mike, I always think of, too, whenever I hear Claude Rains, I think of Rocky Horror. Claude Rains is the Invisible Man. Yes. Yeah. (laughs) Which, he is my favorite Universal Monster, because uh, he's just... I love Claude Rains, and I forgot he was in this, and I'm watching it, and I'm like, oh, he's my favorite... Again, I don't like the character. Guys, you know, (laughs) Twitter, don't get mad at me for this, but, like, he's a great character, because... I loved... I kind of like his little side journey he's going on throughout this, so, like, by the end, where he's... Him and Rick are about to go and fight some uh, Nazis. It's like, wow, I did not expect this turn from this fucking shithead. But, uh, yeah, I like it's it. It's a kind of a weird, you know, like the end, uh, not to fast forward too much, but it's like, you know, like the film ends, obviously Rick, you know, spoil, spoiler alert, you know, he <laughs> chooses to stay back and let them go to America. Um, but you know, he's kind of like, I mean, the famous line, like, this is the start of a beautiful um, friendship. It's kind of, I wasn't expecting that from these two characters who didn't seem like they were, like, all that great of friends or, you know, had this huge affinity for each other. I guess, you know, but then in the end, they are just, like, they're going to, like, hang out in Casablanca now. Like, I'm always curious, like, what what the next scene would be. 
um, if you were to see these two guys like hanging out together. Well, after... see, I think the next scene is um, they have to storm Jabba the Hutt's palace to <laughs> stay an old friend because they're clearly just Han Solo and Lando Calrissian. Uh, it's funny you mentioned the next scene though, Brian, because they originally wanted to shoot a, a scene after that. Uh, there was talk of a scene of like the two of them, uh, Rick and Renault, getting on a boat to go help the resistance, and I think it was just decided that that was too on the nose, um, because it ends so perfectly, uh, with, with one of the most famous ending lines in cinema that ends up being an 80-yard line, it turns out. It, that was not set on set, that was not part of the plan, uh, there were a bunch of alternate lines they were even considering, uh, but... Oh, did I, did I mess up the line? It, it's no, you're right. Louis, this is the start of a beautiful... Friendship, friendship yeah. Right? Okay. Just want to make sure I didn't want to mess that up on the on the podcast. That'd be bad. That's that's fine. There are there are plenty of things we have messed up uh, plenty of times. I think at one point I attribute a Ford to a, tr- a quote to John Ford that was John Houston. I, I it happens. So it, no <laughs> one's no one's called yeah. us out yet. Um, I'm sure it'll happen. Someone will catch up to us eventually. But uh, yeah, there were you know a number of alternate lines they were considering and alternate endings. You know, this is one of the most famous talked about things, but. The whole uh, Rick and Ilsa, you know, Ilsa and Victor getting on the plane was not well, always how they thought it would end. Speaking of um, misquoted lines, I, th- I thought it was kind of funny how often this film gets misquoted. Um, like the play it again, Sam. That's like, I guess, one of the, you know, the more famous lines from the film. And, and that's not, I think, the actual line. She, she says something else instead. But, you know, it's like the, you know, Luke, I am your father. Like yeah. People just... <laughs> well, because it's always... Because the line, I believe, is just play as time goes by. Uh, or, you know, something like play it, Sam. And then, like, play as time goes by. Something like that. And you're right, but the Luke, I am your father, where the line is, you know, no, I am your father. It always gets misquoted, but it gets misquoted in a way that, like, they add... People always add a word that gives it context. Because mm. I think if you said to somebody, play as time goes by, they're not going to recognize that quote you know it's like the it's like the uh, uh snl sketch from that daniel craig episode where they're just saying you know oh name the quote i'm going out now oh of course it's from this you know like no one's gonna get it from that <laughs> so you always add like that extra little bit that gives the context of oh okay yeah play you know such a and it's funny you know uh, a lot of people don't realize that uh as time goes by which is the song that's used in the film it's this uh acclaimed uh, song now it was uh, I think the the AFI voted it the number two greatest song in all of cinema uh, behind Somewhere Over the Rainbow NPR called it the greatest movie song it a lot of people would assume that it won an Oscar because of how important it is but uh, as time goes by it was not written for the film it was a uh, it was a song written by Herman Humpfeld in a 1931 musical called Everybody's Welcome. It was written the song was written into the original play uh, Everybody Comes to Rick's. And when they were making the movie, uh, the composer actually didn't like the song and insisted on writing a new one. The idea being they would shoot the movie first with as time goes by as a factor. Uh, as a song in the scene, and they would go back and reshoot it with a new song. But by the time the composer uh, had written the new song to take the place of his time goes by, uh, Ingrid Bergman had already cut her hair for For Whom the Bell Tolls, so they couldn't do reshoots. So they were stuck with As Time Goes By, which he was not thrilled with, and he wrote the, the score around As Time Goes By, and now it's one of the most iconic movie songs that we almost didn't have. It's, uh, it's kind of like when uh, when Stanley Kubrick uh, used uh, those classical songs as the temp track for 2001 and then uh, ultimately ended up uh, keeping them as opposed to the original score. Again, this movie was a gigantic mistake and it <laughs> all worked out for the benefit for everyone involved, except for Heinrich because, uh, well, uh, nobody liked working with him. Yeah, he was apparently miserable on set called Bar- uh, Bogart a mediocre actor and uh, uh, Bergman did not like him and called him a prima donna. Yeah. And that's part of the problem too with the movie is, is or not the problem with the movie but the problem with the movie they tried to make which was I, I, the directors, the producers wanted this movie to be a uh, a love triangle where you didn't know who Ilsa was going to choose by the end or who Ilsa really loved but the 
chemistry between Bergman and Bogart is so good. And there's no chemistry between her and Heinrich. So the entire time, uh, there's nobody watching this thing who's like, oh, who does she really love? You know who she really loves. Mm-hmm. It's, the, it's is, so uh, obvious the whole time. Which is funny because the first stuff they shot in the movie is the flashback stuff. And Bergman was just like, well, who the hell is she actually supposed to be in love with? Like, how do I play this? And Curtis was just like, eh, play it half and half. Because <laughs> they were just literally just yeah. like, well, what, what do I do? And it's, it, it is wild that how great the chemistry is between Bogart and Bergman because uh, they didn't talk when they weren't shooting because Bogart's wife was so convinced he was banging her that she kept like <laughs> verbally abusing him in his dressing room before t- uh, setups that he was ju- he would just get so fucking annoyed and pissed off that when they were done shooting, he'd just like leave and just like play chess by himself or whatever the fuck because he was just like, my wife is driving me fucking crazy. I'm not even going to p- put any goddamn fuel on this fire. And it's wild that they even have any chemistry, let alone as dyna- dynamic a set of chemistry as they do. Because, yeah. Well, he did. He did talk to her a little bit because the story goes that before they started shooting the film, Bogart was teaching Bergman how to play poker. Yeah. And while he was teaching her, he happened to, you know, when they were passing around and, and you know asking her to call. Uh, he used the phrase, here's looking at you, kid. Yeah. And he ultimately would use that in the flashback. Yeah, which was line. Impro- yeah. yeah, it was improvised. And Curtiz loved it so much, it becomes one of the iconic lines of the film. Yeah. I mean, it's the thing at the end of the movie. Yeah, I'm surprised, too, that like um, that they used the line so as many times as they did. Like, I always just think about the end, but he says it like in Paris, and then I think he says it like again in the middle. He gets like a good four or five times, I think, out of that. It's it's a remarkable thing because, you know, we talk about putting this thing together uh, as it goes along. And it is a, you know, I think there's a temptation. And, and Brian, I mean, obviously you, you've you got a film of your own. You've been, uh, you know, that you have now. And when you're making a film, there's always this temptation to kind of have everything figured out ahead of time because... Look, these things cost money, and and uh, these things take time, and you want to, you know, you, you want to make sure everything's going to work out. Uh, and with this film, they had so many opportunities to kind of develop Rick and Elsa's relationship and develop the characters and the interplay. So while the script is great and has some great lines in it, it also was stuff that was kind of built out of improvisation during the flashback, and uh, you know, the script kind of being written on the fly. You get these little. Uh, moments built out of the natural chemistry between the actors that I don't think you would have had had it been the kind of production where, well, we've got the script written, it's set in stone, we've prevised all these effect sequences, and uh, we know what the movie's going to be. It did kind of organically find its way to being the best of all possible versions. Well, it's and it's funny, too, about the script, because it seems like they were also just picking and picking lines from older Warner Brothers movies, because as I'm looking at my computer screen right now, the I'm shocked, shocked, uh, you know, from that is from an old Boris Karloff movie, Five Star Final, which uh, I also forgot that whole thing. I'm shocked, shocked to find out there is gambling going on in this establishment. I forgot that it was from this movie, which, again, Claude Rains, just good job, buddy. You're, you're, you're my favorite. You're my favorite little fella. <laughs> my favorite 52-year-old weird sex criminal man. Now... Brian, let me let me ask you from a directorial perspective because again, you've you've got a feature out now. Um, you obviously, especially for the film that you made, uh, you know, you obviously had a a, a natural endpoint and you knew how to get there because it's a film that kind of requires knowing where your story is going. But how much stuff did you kind of find on the day of during the shoot? Was it something where everything was just by the book, or was it something where stuff kind of uh moved and it was a little more fluid based on the day yeah i mean you know very different experience but just you know in terms of of when you're kind of like watching over all these different elements at play um i would be you know my my, i'd be going like a thousand different directions at once and then you really have the actors there who are solely focused on their character and their lines and what they can do and stuff so that's really when you get the good shit, you know, it's like when you get them to um, rehearse it, go over it and then make those changes that, you know, could just be like, you know, 
cutting a line or maybe like changing uh, an inflection or something. Um, and we had tons of that, you know, throughout the shoot, throughout the shoot. So um, I know like uh, in this, like, I guess Humphrey Bogart, um, he added like the, ch the whole chess thing because he was like a huge chess player and, you know, that became part of the character. So I don't know, whenever there is like an opportunity for, you know, someone else to come in and give thought to um, to a character. I think it's I think it's always a good thing. I mean, you might not necessarily agree, you know, all the time with uh, with the change, but um, just getting different perspectives on things can can really help. It's it's so interesting too because you know people don't give Curtiz a lot of credit as a as a filmmaker. Um, you know, I, I think that, uh, you know, I remember, uh, Roger Ebert had the quote, uh, he was quoting someone else, but I'm, I'm just attributing it to Ebert cause I can't remember who it was now. Um, saying that this film is the ultimate refutation of the auteur theory, which is, which frustrates me a bit because yes, it was kind of made on the fly, but I, I've watched a number of, of Curtiz's films, um, Angel's Dirty Faces, this, he did a couple of those Errol Flynn adventure films, uh, the adventures of Robin Hood and, uh, Seahawk. Uh, I love those films as a kid. Uh, and just because he doesn't have the most distinct visual language, I, I don't think he should be, or because he was so willing to collaborate, I think people kind of write him off. Uh, with Casablanca, he made a point, and with a lot of his films, uh, people complain that the shots are not particularly memorable in Casablanca. Uh, and that's because Curtis's attitude was, he doesn't want to do a single shot that doesn't service the story. He doesn't want a camera to move in any way that's not the which, service which of what's being said. Also, a weird thing to light lob at Casablanca because it's a fucking gorgeous movie. Like, what the yeah. hell are people talking about? I mean, this 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 is a, again. It feels like another case of people like thinking they understand what the auteur theory is and not really getting it because it's like would like, it, it feels like people are just assuming like oh this movie was kind of a nightmare to make and it was kind of like found as they went so it, it was like a collaboration and blah blah blah. And it's like all right, but would you say that like Apocalypse Now wasn't an or tourist movie from the mind of Francis Ford Coppola. Like, no, I mean, that movie was a little, a nightmare, literally destroyed a man's mind. But I mean, I don't know. People listen, evergreen tweet pinned on my page. People are dumb. I don't know what else to say. Well, it's also like, I, I I've never understood this idea, not to get too in the weeds, uh, but you know, Brian, we're all film school brats. You could probably uh, speak to this too. You know, I think there's a lot of misunderstanding uh, people our age and, you know, maybe a little older, but like a misunderstanding of the auteur theory where the idea, it has been reduced to this idea that, well, that means that the director is the be all end all and every decision is attributed to them and they're the ultimate decider. And where that irks me is that, you know, even the, the people who kind of originate that auteur theory, the, the original advocates for it, the Cahiers du Cinema guys, the Francois Truffaut, Jean-Luc Godard, that whole group, they were always working on each other's films. They were always contributing. You know, there are so many of those movies where it's like, well, you know, tr this is Truffaut's film, but Godard shot this, and and uh, Melville was over here, and, and, and Jacques Demy was here, and they were all working on it and all collaborating, and so I, I'm always confused when, pe when we've kind you know, the auteur theory is just attributing, uh, I think, a, a particular style or a particular message that draws these artists in. I'm, I'm confused as to why there's this sense now, especially, like I said, people are, who kind of attribute, kind of think of it as, well, the auteur theory means that a director has is is literally deciding the color of every curtain and, and every single element, and they are in control of everything, you know? Um, I, I was kind of thinking about this, too, when I was kind of going back through its legacy, and... Um, you know, I think people make a distinction between Casablanca being like a popular mainstream film versus like it being, you know, more of an art house film, like a like a Godard or a Fellini or something. Do you, do you think that there is something to the fact that this was, you know, a very artful film? It was very, you know, it's, you know, it's a masterpiece, but it's also something that like regular people had, you know, consumed and digested and was part of the you know, the whole like national vernacular, you know, it's like your, your parents saw Casablanca, your grandparents saw it. Like it's, it's more universal in a sense because it's not as like artsy. 
yeah that made sense. no i agree with you because i think that the, the thing about it and the thing with curtiz's directing style is you're right it is an artistic film and there are some great shots uh you know that 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 seek that shot where uh renault follows rick and rick is putting something in the safe and we see renault and then there's a light coming through the window and we watch rick's silhouette as he puts things in the in the safe looks gorgeous it's a beautiful shot it looks like it was ripped out of the adventures of prince ahmed on the, on the right hand side um but curtis was not doing anything he would not do you know he would not do a single shot unless it was in service of the story nothing was needlessly artsy nothing was done for the sake of oh this shot would look good it was all story conscious and as a result i think not just casablanca but so many of those films especially so many bogart films uh maltese falcon angel's dirty faces you know the to bring it back to the kaiju cinema guys you were just invoking uh ryan of your Godard and all that it was those guys who who really sort of looked at what were considered populist non-art films uh, of america and went actually there's a lot going on here and there's a lot going on here because these were kind of the movies that were given the lesser budgets. These were not the for whom the bell tolls. These were the movies where they were like, you've got a, a, a tiny budget, do what you can. And these directors made magic out of that. And that's what, I mean, let's face it, uh, you know, to talk about Godard, uh, Godard's first film, uh, Breathless, is all jean paul Belmondo uh, idolizing Humphrey Bogart. Like, that's what it's all about. Uh, and, and Band of Outsiders is, you know, well, we're all tough guys like Bogart and the, the hats and the suits and, you know, uh, Le Samurai and, and uh, Lady Luce and all that. It's all riffing on these these kind of Humphrey Bogart films. So I think that you're right in the fact that they were popular films and they don't, it doesn't get it to do that way. And yet you don't get any of those European art films without those guys looking at, those guys and, and women, you know, uh, but those filmmakers looking at these American films like Casablanca and going, there's actually more to this than you guys are giving it credit for. There's actually more to this movie than just the story. There's more to this movie than just Rick and Ilsa. Look at all these other things going on. I mean, it's shit we still deal with today. I mean, it's it's like it's it's if something is is entertaining on a surface level, it, it like trips people like some high minded folks up that like, oh, well, if it's good on the surface, then there's nothing to dig for. But a lot of the times like, no, there's there's gold in them there hills like movies aren't accidents i mean even an even when a movie's like casablanca is kind of an accident like there were decisions being made on the fly like well why did curtis make these decisions why did they do this why did he let bogart make these improvisations it's like dig deep like yeah i mean a lot of times movies that are just surface level exist but then you get a casablanca where it's this is great to just sit down and watch and you don't need to think about it because it's just a great story. But then if you put the effort in, like the Kai Kai the Cinema guys did, there's there's shit going on that's pushing cinema forward in ways that if you just pull your heads out of your goddamn asses, like it's a it's just it's it's art. It's it's not just content as as it is of the day. I think there's also yeah. something to, uh, and again, to your point, Brian, I think there's something to the fact that, and this is my favorite thing about Casablanca, I think there's something that people outside of America see in this film that we don't see here, because I think that there are there are movies um, that I, there are two that come to mind that I remember hearing of as, oh, this is Britain's Casablanca, and this is France's Casablanca, and I'm kind of convinced that every country uh, has their... Their Casablanca, their immortal love story that taps into what is, and they're usually around the same period, uh, around the same like forties time. But their their fundamental like this is the quintessential uh, cinematic. It's got adventure. It's got romance. Um, I think about and and I'm sure that every country has one. And uh, this is a call to action. Uh, our international listeners. I know we've got listeners. I I I'm always surprised by this, but we have listeners in 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 ireland and vietnam and in so many different countries um if if you know you know please write to us uh you know you're missing out podcast at gmail.com or hit me up on twitter what is your country's casablanca i'm fascinated because i remember to uh, obviously the the british casablanca in a lot of ways i think and i hear this is uh, another film i love which is brief encounter um holds the same kind of distinction as casablanca does here 
And in France, I, you know, I remember in high school reading about um, Children of Paradise and how Children of Paradise is like the French Casablanca. And they're each, all three of them, the same kind of story of there's a love triangle involved and there's all this, this heartache and there's an element of adventure to them, especially Children of Paradise. But what's great is when you watch them all together, you kind of see like, oh, of course, the British Casablanca would be about a housewife living a life of quiet desperation. Uh, and of course, the French Casablanca would involve uh, a mime and, uh, you know, and the Nazi occupation of France. And then the American version of the same story is about essentially Rick as a metaphor for America's own reluctance to join the war effort. When you look at it in that context, and I think that most Americans were just watching it as a populist film, but I think across the world, when they watch it, there's something so fundamentally American to it, you know, and especially yeah. to Rick. Just just having Humphrey Bogart in that role, I, I think, is like cements, you know, part of that like old Hollywood American, um, you know, not, not only just legacy, but like th this idealism, like, you know, when you when other countries are thinking about us and they're thinking about Hollywood, you know, especially old Hollywood, um, he's one of the first faces that I see, you know, in, in my mind, you know, is, is Humphrey Bogart, you know, with the cigarette, you know, in the white tux. And um, he just kind of almost symbolizes, you know, that that sort of ideal um, that I'm sure a lot of people kind of looked up to. Yeah. I mean, that's, you know, again, to go back to I mean, that's that's what that's the whole arc in Breathless. I, I fully agree. But I think that one thing I want to give credit for, you know, Bogart gets a lot of credit for this movie, as he should. You know, he's iconic in it. I, especially on this most recent viewing, could not get over Ingrid Bergman's performance. I was so struck by how many things she does that no other person could pull off as well. She takes lines that that should just be, you know, lines on paper. That should just be like, you know, getting the point across. The way that she delivers, you used to be a much better liar, Sam. The way that, and of course, anybody who listens to the podcast, you must remember this, knows the way that she does the da 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 It all just, there's such an incredible presence to her in this movie. And I think that without it, with anybody else in that role, with any other actress, um, it doesn't work because you need to... It's kind of like, uh, you know, when we talked on Gone with the Wind, uh, Tom, we talked about how I think it's so important. And George Cukor did a great job of making sure that every one of the Southern men is just pale and washed out and uninteresting so that when Gable comes on screen, he obviously pops. Right. Yeah. yeah. I think the same way, even though there's a lot of different people and, and there's a, a fascinating cast of characters, everybody from, you know, uh, the, the pudgy uh, waiter working there, you know, with the German accent to the people, uh, you know, the pickpocket. There's so many colorful characters in this film. And yet Ilsa is immediately just every time she's on screen, you can't take your eyes off her. She's doing so many things. The way that she smiles at, at Bogart in the flashback, the the incredible uh, I made a note here saying the look on Bergman's face when as time goes by plays is is masterful. Maybe the best close up since the Passion of Joan of Arc. Like the 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 faces she's making as Sam plays as time goes by, you don't actually even need the flashback stuff because she is telling you everything about her and Rick's past in just her face while that song plays. Well, it's without her and her, the kind of presence she brings because I don't know if you could really like just cast someone who who just could make that kind of presence like I, it's just I, I don't know how to explain it but like she just has this presence and you need it because it's not even just her effect on rick it's also her effect on laszlo and even to an extent like it's not very obvious but even her effect on claude rains's character like you get the sense he makes the change he does because he sees what this woman does to this guy he thought he knew so well was like just this low down dirty just mercenary and he like he he sees he can now see like what 
Rick sees and he gets it and he gets why Rick does what he does and he then he makes a change and it's the most important part of the movie. I mean, even more than Rick. I mean, Humphrey Bogart's a big important part of this movie, but if you don't believe these three men would in their their ways at different points in time would fight the Nazis and put their lives at risk for her, the movie just doesn't work. And and there's also this element too, and what I love is that this is one of the, and it's it's so funny that this ending was sort of tossed on at the end. Not tossed on, but you know, they 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 weren't sure how it was gonna end because so many movies do that cliche that I, you know, Tom, I, you know, we, we've both talked about, uh, you know, the things that we're kind of a sucker for. And I know this is, you know, the kind of ending that, you're, that is more in your wheelhouse of those things of the, you know, the guy who's like, you know, uh, I ain't good enough for her. You know, this is, uh, you know, I, I, I love her and we love each other, but she deserves somebody better. And I'm going to walk off into the sunset. What I love about this is that it actually pulls that off in a way that so many movies when it ends that way and he walks off in the sunset, you're like, no, turn around, go back, go back to her. Like you and, you know, uh, you know, you guys, Michael Paré, you, you should be with her. Turn around, go back. What I love about this is that it ends with Rick making this decision of, yeah, I love her. We love each other, but she should be with him because he is a better guy. And, and those two would, you know, she'll be better off with him. And even though you can tell those two love each other, uh, Rick and Elsa, you do also fully buy, like, yeah, I get it. She should be with him. Like, you totally understand his thinking, and and he's right. Um, not that you don't want those two together, but, you know, that it... This is actually the perfect execution of... They love each other, but, she, you know, she should be with someone better. Like, she could do better with him. That that her and Laszlo will do better things. And I think the important po- moment in that scene is him lying to laszlo yes and saying she tried to convince me she still loves me but i know i knew she didn't but doing that to protect you i'm gonna let you guys go and then claude rain's going what the hell are you talking about i know you're full of shit (laughs) and to bring it back to brief encounter what i love is laszlo in his face doesn't buy it either yeah it's he doesn't say it but it's like when rick is saying you know she uh she said she loved me but i knew it was a lie all three of those people in that space and Reigns too, like everyone in that space knows that that's not true, but they all decide to agree to that lie, which to bring it back to Brief Encounter, it's like my favorite part of Brief Encounter is the husband saying, you've been a long ways away. Thank you for coming back to me. This idea of just like, I know this isn't true. I know that you have feelings for somebody else. So thank you for staying with me. It's such a great moment, you know? Because as they say, what's three... Three little lies amount to yeah. a couple of beans. I mean, it's move. Listen, guys, brace yourselves. This is a good movie, <laughs> and it makes a lot of good decisions. And like, I know you, we we say they couldn't make a movie like this today. They keep trying to make Casablanca, but like, they really couldn't make this today because they don't hide the fact that Rick and Claude Rains are kind of scummy guys yeah, and that they have a redemption and that their redemption means more knowing the lows they've hit and that they're willing to pull out from it. So like, I feel like main characters today kind of aren't allowed to be as close to unlikable as these two guys really are. And it's, it's so funny you say we couldn't make it today and, and not even this like, Oh, people are too uptight or anything like that. But the fact that you're right, it allows the heroes to be murky. I mean, you know, Rick is clearly a and Rick's turn in Casablanca is very much echoed in Han Solo. Yeah. Uh and the way that he comes back with the Falcon and the fact that he's a bad dude, a gun runner, morally ambiguous who chooses the right side just like Rick. And yet, you know, talk about today when they make the Han Solo prequel movie, they have to make sure they're like, "No, he's actually good. He's a totally good guy. He's got a good heart. Everything's good about him." Or, but you know, that, when they Lucas's insistence on Han doesn't shoot first, taking away yeah. any sort of like, oh, he killed a guy in cold blood. You, like you have to just now sand even that little edge off of him. <laughs> I was like, in this one, Rick shoots first. <laughs> yeah, no, he does. It's such a and and not only that. Uh, you know, I loved. I even though I've seen this so many times, 
when you have that moment when Renault walks up to Laszlo and Ilsa and he's like, well, you see, Victor, you didn't know the two of them are in love. And he turns around and Rick's got the gun. I pump my fist. It's such a great moment. It's such a good like, yeah. yeah. I want to ask, Brian, because you I mean, I know you know the film, but this was your first time watching it in full. How many moments did you have, if any, where you kind of felt like, I don't know what Rick's going to do here? Like, of course, you know how it ends with the plane, but I feel like this movie does a pretty good job of setting up, like, you not being entirely sure what Rick is going to do. Yeah, I mean, I I think for a moment towards the end, because I knew, I, I knew that, you know, something was going to happen at the end of the plane, and, and you know, the MacGuffin is the, uh, the tickets that Rick has that he kind of, like, is like a big plot point throughout that Rick has this power. Um, but I think it was the moment towards the end when um, it might have been, it might have been Claude who said that, that, you know, that the husband that, you know, um, Paul Heinrich, that he was going to go to like a concentration camp or something. If, if Rick like had sold him out, yeah. and I was like, Oh, he's not going to do that. <laughs> like I, up until that point, I thought maybe he's a little unscrupulous, but like, just as like an anti-hero, I knew that there was a ba- like there was gonna be a line that Rick would not cross, and um, that was when I was like, oh, he's probably gonna be like you know the hero in the end. But um, up until that point, I didn't really know because he's kind of like he's kind of like a dick to yeah. so, like you know a lot of <laughs> a lot of people like you know coming up to him asking for help. Um, that woman who asks him for help and he like doesn't really help her. Oh, he does help her actually. Yeah, he's he's a good guy. He doesn't like to show it, but he's a good guy. And I love, uh, I mean, first off, we have to acknowledge because we're just, there's so much to acknowledge and there's not enough time. But uh, that that whole, you know, you don't get on the plane, you're going to regret it. Maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow. Uh, but someday, for the rest of you, just none of us will ever write anything that good as long as we live. I think we've all made peace with that now. That's just one of those things you hit and you're like, oh, this is perfect. But it's it's funny you mentioned the, the tickets and the MacGuffin of the tickets. I was listening to Roger Ebert's commentary on this film uh, today. And Ebert goes, you know, not to not to be difficult about this, but uh, you know, uh, one flaw: uh, no one ever checks their tickets. And I, at first, I was like, oh, that's some cinema sins bullshit. But then I sat around, I was like, he's, he's right. No one there. There's no these. T- <laughs> this whole movie's about getting these tickets. No one checks them. No one <laughs> checks the transit passes um, because it doesn't matter. Um, and the other thing I about that ending scene is one thing I love, and to talk about the influence this has, and I, I Tom, I'm sure you can test this, this time watching it, when the camera cuts toward the end from Ilsa to Rick to Ilsa to Victor, and like that quick cuts, I kept thinking of the good, the bad, and the ugly standoff. Oh, absolutely. How that had to be a factor. Uh, post-war, I mean, I think, so, I, I mean, I don't know, I, I've read that Sergio Leone watched as many movies as he could, and there was like a big bootleg fucking cinema, like, real scheme going on in Italy during the war because uh, Mussolini wasn't letting uh, movies play. And uh, so I, I'm sure at some point b- between now and uh, I guess I'll say Colossus of Rhodes when he starts directing his own stuff that he saw Casablanca and was like, oh, yes, this is how I need to do this thing in all my movies of just rapid cut close ups. Now we're running low on, on time because of course, you know, Brian, you got stuff to do, but I do want to take a couple things to single out and then touch on what you want to uh, single out. But we, ha- we haven't even talked about Dooley Wilson, who is incredible in this movie as Sam. I mean, especially you know, look, we do, we do, Brian, we do a lot of old movies on this podcast and uh, <laughs> the, the treatment of people of color in uh, pretty much any film besides the learning tree that we've done is abysmal. Um, so to see Dooley Wilson as Sam and to imagine, quite frankly, what arguments must have been going on at the studio when the writers and the producers were going, yes, his best friend in the world is a black man who he treats equally, who has a kind of heroic role in the film, uh, you know, and it's never commented on and and there's nothing, criti- you know, there's nothing... Um, uh, you know, there's no effort to make him lesser. Uh, I love Julie Wilson in this film, and it's one of the few films he made, and he's just so instantly iconic in this movie. And to speak of iconic, the... God, that shot after Ilsa leaves, you know, the, the famous of all the gin joints in all the world, just... Oh, yeah. His Wilson's performance in that scene, because I think everybody talks about Rick and his, you know, Bogart's delivery of, of all the gin joints and the, the way he slams the table... But we've all been on sets 
And we all know firsthand a good performance, even a great performance, can be absolutely ruined if the other person in the scene isn't there for it. If if the other guy talking to Rick during that scene had been stiff, had not known how to respond to those deliveries, that scene would have died. That scene would have seen over the top was even flat. But Dooley Wilson is the perfect scene partner to Bogart in every single scene that he's in in this film. Yeah, there's an incredible part too when Rick is waiting for Ilsa to come back to the club and he's just like drinking by himself, like in the dark. Yes. With like no one there. And, and Sam is like, I'm going to stay with you. And he tells like, no, I'll go home. And he's like, I'm going to stay with you. And I was like, you never had a scene like that. Yeah. In, you know, 1940 cinema, like, you know, which I, you know, it's pretty amazing. And that incredible white suit that Bogart is wearing, where that bright yeah. white suit in that absolutely pitch black set is incredible. Brian, but we always wrap up talking Oscars, but did you have anything else you wanted to add before we talk about Casablanca's Oscar history? I, you know, yeah, just, I wanted to actually shout out my friend who, um, Dan, who gave me the DVD to watch. And he, um, when I asked him if he could describe the word in one word, he had said uh, smooth. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was a great adjective just for this film. It's like everything is smooth from beginning to end. There's, you know, it's like just a master built, you know, Swiss watch or something, you know. (laughs) And, uh, you know, and I I know it didn't it didn't sweep the Oscars, but it won a few. Right. I mean, yeah, we're we're going to touch on we're going to touch on what it was. So. Uh, Casablanca won Best Picture in its year. It was nominated alongside For Whom the Bell Tolls, which was the other Ingrid Bergman film. Um, Ernst Lubitsch's Heaven Can Wait, which uh, is not the uh, Warren Beatty film. It's a very confusing thing. Um, They share a title, not a plot. Uh, The Human Comedy, In Which We Serve, um, which is uh, a David Lean film, to bring up Brief Encounter. Uh, Madame Curie, The More the Merrier, The Oxbow Incident, The Song of Bernadette, and Watch on the Rhine. Those were all the Best Picture nominees. Uh, Casablanca won Best Picture. It won Best Director for Michael Curtiz. Humphrey Bogart was nominated for Best Actor, but lost to Paul Lucas in Watch on the Rhine, which is another World War II-themed film. Claude Rains was nominated for Best Supporting Actor for this film, lost to Charles Coburn in The More the Merrier. The film won Best Adapted Screenplay, It was nominated for Best Scoring, but lost to The Song of Bernadette. Best Cinematography, lost to Song of Bernadette. And Best Film Editing, which lost to a film called Air Force. Which, uh, listen, no, Song of Bernadette is a fine film, but it is wild to me that it won for uh, score and cinematography. The other thing worth noting, Ingrid Bergman, despite being amazing in this film, is not even nominated for Best Actress for this film. She does get a Best Actress nomination for For Whom the Bell Tolls, which, uh, I'll say it, she's not great in. She's fine. Um, it's her blood diamond. <laughs> it's very weird. <laughs> it's very weird. Um, I will say something that's going to get Tom very mad, though. Well, you already pissed me off by telling me Claude Rains didn't get shit, so... Uh, what if I told you that, uh, having watched all these films... Mm-hmm. I would have given it to Charles Coburn in The More the Merrier too. Coburn is very good in The More the Merrier. Um, you're lucky you're not next to me. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's fascinating. Michael Curtiz, uh, one thing I love about Curtiz that's fascinating is he won Best Director this year. In 1938, he was nominated for Best Director twice. He was nominated for Four Daughters, and he was also nominated for Angels with Dirty Faces. Both. Like, imagine getting nominated for Best Director for two different movies in the same year. Bonkers. Did- did he win? No. One of the two? No, he did not, uh, unfortunately. But he did win He did win for a short film uh, called Sons of Liberty the year prior. He's a fascinating filmmaker. I'm, you know, Curtis. He doesn't get enough credit. Guy makes Adventures of Robin Hood, Yankee Doodle Dandy, uh, Mildred Pierce, White Christmas, King Creole with Elvis. He has an incredible career. But so Casablanca ends up, it does win Best Picture, despite not being one of the favorites and not being one that the studios dumped a lot of money into. It's fascinating that this thing kind of won, and I have to imagine that it was kind of, at least in studio considerations, kind of an underdog. You know, it certainly was not for whom the bell tolls was more hyped. Uh, Madame Curie has Greer Garson. Uh, you know, Watch on the Rhine is a big deal with Paul Lucas. Uh, you know, it kind of feels like even though now it's this established classic, and rightfully so, nobody really had high expectations for this movie, and it ends up 
becoming a, a classic. It's also, uh, one thing worth noting, was released in November of 1942 in New York when it debuted. So the New York Film Critics Circle gave it Best Picture for 1942. Oh, I'm sorry, it, it nominated it, it, it but the New York Film Critics Circle gave the award to In Which We Serve, but the Academy decided that it wouldn't count for their nominations until its national release in 1943. So Casablanca basic is, is the only film uh, to win Best Picture technically the year after it came out, which is a very weird uh, kind of divide there. Huh. Yeah, it's uh, it's fascinating, you know. Uh, and again, I've watched all these Best Picture nominees. Uh, there's no doubt Casablanca is is the best among them. It's just, it stands out so much. Uh, a remarkable film and a remarkable uh, year. Was it, was it a box office hit? Did people like actually go see it or was it more appreciated like later down the line? No, it was, a, yeah, it was a hit. Uh, I don't have the exact uh, numbers on it, especially because... I, I do, the, actually. Give me one second. Oh, you second. do? Oh, excellent. Um, yeah, I, I do, actually. Yeah, according to this, and uh, granted, I'm getting this from Wikipedia, so I, I do apologize if it's not perfect, but um, according to this, the budget uh, was about $878,000, which is about the equivalent of $13.7 million in 2019. Uh, the box office was anywhere between three point seven and six point nine million dollars. Yeah, I, so it was just you know ran the table, and of course it has endured uh, for decades uh, since. Uh, Brian, I want to thank you so much uh, for joining us for this, for taking a chance not just on this film, but for coming on this show. And I do want to take another opportunity to remind folks um, that your film myth is available now. It's streaming on Amazon Prime. Are there any other services it's on? Yeah, um, if you don't have Amazon, uh, it's on Tubi, uh, you know, and uh, T-U-B-I. Uh, I think it's a free platform. Um, there's actually a lot of cool movies on there. And uh, I think it's also available on YouTube as well. Excellent. And uh, do you have, for, for our audience, if you don't mind, I hate to put you on the spot, but uh, for our audience sake, because I don't want to give anything away too much, what is, what is your kind of one sentence logline pitch so that our listeners get a sense of what that film is, uh, what that film is all about? Oh, for myth? Yes. No, no, sum up Casablanca. I want you to just pitch our audience on watching Casablanca. No, like how, you know, if, if folks are curious about your film, how to, you know, to give them an idea without giving anything away. I'd say it's a dark, cerebral, coming of age dramedy about a kid who meets his favorite uh, film director and chaos ensues. <laughs> <laughs> Once again, Brian, thank you so much for joining us uh, for this film. I'm glad we got you to, to check it out, uh, and I'm glad you enjoyed it so much. Um, and it was truly great to have you on. Um, you know, it, it was great to hear from you again. I, you know, uh, obviously we haven't seen each other in a while because uh, of you know, all this. And from the bottom of my heart, sincerely, I, I said it before at the start, but you gave you gave each of us our, our first shot, and uh, it really it really means a lot. So, oh. so thank you for joining us, and we hope we, we can uh, have you back on a future season. Yeah, thank you again. This has been a blast, and I can't wait to hear more more episodes in the future. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks so much. So Casablanca was one of my uh, film lots, I guess. I hadn't seen it. Obviously, uh, one of the classics that everybody's like, oh, you got to watch it. Like It's like Citizen Kane up there. Um, and I wasn't disappointed. Uh, a lot of what I'm uh, noticing with the films this season, and I don't want to delve too much into this because we'll probably do this during the wrap up, but I feel like a lot of these first season movies are based on the way that, um, you know, a lot of the timelessness of the cinematography, I think. We're talking about, um, you know, I, I've got a buddy of mine, hopefully that we can get on the show that had recommended Casablanca to me after I did a double feature of La La Land and Allied um, that just coincidentally happened to use elements of that film. And um, I don't, I don't, I don't know. I, I, I guess as much as I want to, as much as I like harping on its legacy and, and the importance of the film, I feel like there is one aspect that I did want to touch on. It's a little bit of a blot on on its own legacy that I don't think we really touched on. One of the stories I wanted to mention, and it actually connects with the Oscar talk that we've had, um, but one of the things that kind of irked me doing research about this film was finding out that the producer, uh, Hal Wallace, um, when he got up to accept the award, uh, was pretty much uh, blocked from doing that 
uh, because the studio head at the time, Jack Warner, decided to rush up uh, to the stage and accept it on his behalf. Um, he mentioned, uh, he's basically said like he couldn't believe that was happened, had like 40 years of trauma surrounded by it, just like could not fathom that his creation was being accepted by somebody who had essentially no contribution whatsoever to his project and it haunted him for the rest of his life and fuck i can't get over that yeah that is that is that's kind of those those i I don't have (laughs) the i i think and we talked extensively about the auteur theory in the episode and i think that the auteur theory took hold in part because Trying to actually determine who makes a movie, who is responsible for a movie, is so difficult. Uh, it's so confusing and and so chaotic in terms of, well, who did what and who did this, that I think people just like a neat little package of, uh, of okay, fine, it's all the director. That's it. We know who to give credit to now, because it's so much more complicated than that. There is one thing, if Please. you don't mind, I did have not a not an official not an official uh, email per se, but I did have a listener of ours who reached out and wanted to ask a question. Um, they mentioned it was a probably a silly question. Uh, given wait, wait, we have we have listener mail. Yes, we have listener. Mail. Awesome, and if anybody has any questions for us, they can uh, hit us up at your missing out podcast gmail dot com. Uh, maybe we'll even do a mailbag episode if we get enough. But yeah, what, what's the question? Yeah, um, I mean, it, th- they do mention that it is probably a silly question, uh, but they wanted to know the difference between the National Film Registry and AFI. Oh, sure. Okay. So uh, I'm, I'm happy to take this one. Uh, so the difference is, uh, the, I, I don't know if they mean the list or the organizations, but um, so the American Film Institute is a nonprofit organization but it's a private organization that funds film education uh and preservation uh you know many people attended the afi conservatory uh darren aronofsky david lynch uh to name a few wally fister uh more recently uh terrence malick petty jenkins but that's a a private organization and their lists their 100 greatest movies or whatever are just lists that they made uh they pulled people and they made these lists uh from a jury of just oh these are the greatest films and they're a very reputable organization and uh you know have done a lot of good uh in film history uh and film conservation uh wonderful organization Uh, you know i loved the afi list growing up but that's a private organization uh the national film registry is a portion of the library of congress that's a, a government organization. So uh, the AFI is just a, a private group, uh, kind of like the Academy or the Golden Globes or something like that, where it's a private group of people uh, who come together and their mission is film education and preservation. So that's their lists are just a, a jury coming together to pick like, oh, these are the greatest films, but it doesn't go any further than that. With the National Film Registry, it's done with preservation as the primary goal. So the idea is instead of picking films based on just, oh, we think of the greatest films of all time, the National Film Registry's goal is picking films that are worthy of preservation. And that doesn't always mean because it's the greatest movies ever made. And in the first year, yeah, we mostly get that. But you know, as we move on, you guys are going to see, we get things like duck and cover. We get things, uh, old r- reels of film and film serials and things that are just culturally significant. So it's more about the idea of telling the story of america preserving our cultural heritage uh, our collective cultural heritage through preserving film um so yeah one's private one's public it's uh they're they're different things with very different missions but both uh wonderful organizations that i support to wrap up like we usually do what films would you guys include in the registry Uh, remember it must be an american film that's at least 10 years old so i was thinking about it and there's a lot of films i could have picked i think for a long time i actually had a different film in mind for this uh there was a little more one-to-one but i was trying to think about what has endured about casablanca and why it still hits as hard as it does because there's certainly plenty of films from that era that meant a lot in that era that aren't uh if we're talking about films that kind of reflect the american wartime experience a movie like mrs miniver hasn't endured the way that casablanca has great film but hasn't endured the way it has or watch on the rhine or anything like that and i think what it is and what makes Casablanca so universal is it is a movie about heartache and regret 
and you know running into somebody you used to love or that you still love and and that twinge you know um that uh, in a way uh there's that feeling you know how people say it's better to have loved and lost you know if we're lucky we all have a rick or an ilsa in our lives you know that we have that and that feeling and that experience uh and that even though those memories are hurt uh you know it's better uh to feel that hurt than to have never felt it at all and that that's kind of to me the the central thing in this movie is it's it's so many people try and remake Casablanca and they're missing that. You could, you don't need the war stuff. You don't need the Nazis. You don't need any of that because what it's really about is Rick running into Ilsa. Ilsa with this other man. What does he do? Can he make himself the person that she would have wanted him to be? So with that in mind, I started thinking about a film that also really touches on the idea of lost love and, and how do you process uh, how do you process heartache and how do you process the the memories of what you could have had those sad memories uh, and a movie that also in its own way is kind of a thriller it's a film that uh is is an undeniable classic to me it is a film that stands out as one of the best films if not the best film of the decade it came out in and the kind of movie that just was undeniable. Uh, I keep using the word undeniable. I shouldn't lean on that too much. But it was a thing that you knew about and you've heard about. Even if you haven't seen it, you've heard about it. Uh, and it was so unique. And it just gets to the heart of this feeling so much, which is Charlie Kaufman and Michelle Gondry's uh, Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind from 2004. I mean, you know, so many movies since Casablanca have tried to tell that story have tried to tap into the idea of, okay, how do you deal with a lost love? And in that way, uh, you know, most of them fail because they're just trying to do what Casablanca did and Casablanca did it right. Eternal Sunshine introduces this brilliant conceit of if you could erase those memories, should you? Um, you know, that, that brilliant premise uh, that we all kind of feel when we're feeling down, when we feel that lost love, we think, can I just, what if I could just wipe it out? And so many people who, after a relationship ends, they go, ah, I'm just going to tear up all the photographs and throw out all their stuff, and I don't want to think about it anymore. And the movie has this beautiful message, this beautiful idea of, no, hang on to these memories, even if they hurt because they matter, and this was a special moment, and, and this meant something. It was a remarkable film when it came out. I remember when it came out and thinking just, Oh God, I've never seen anything like this, especially because when it came out, I had not seen uh, the Spike Jones films that he did with Charlie Kaufman because I was just too young. I didn't know being John Malkovich. I didn't know uh, adaptation. Uh, it was my first exposure to Charlie Kaufman, first exposure to Michel Gondry, and I was just blown away. It, it, I, I had never seen anything like it. And I think that a lot of people felt that way. It's a, such a weird out there movie, but it won the Oscar for screenplay. Uh, Winslet got a nomination for Best Actress that I, I I don't remember the year that well. She probably should have just won it. Uh, yeah, maybe maybe should have just won it. So it, it's just an incredible film, uh, a, a unique film, and I think that again, when you talk about the greatest films of the two thousands, if you talk, you know, Lord of the Rings probably comes up, and then Dark Knight comes up. Those are the big populist films. But once you get past that, Eternal Sunshine comes up pretty damn quick. Um, it's Maybe career best performances from Winslet and Carey. Incredible scenes that you never forget, ironically. Uh, even that goddamn polyphonic spree song just sticks with you. Incredible film. Uh, absolutely should be in the registry. Captures the 2000s in a, in a perfect way. Has the manic pixie dream girl stuff without being over the top with it because it kind of helps birth that <laughs> trope. Beautiful film, wonderful film. And I think really touches on the same theme as Casablanca, but in a radically different way. So Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind should absolutely be in the National Film Registry. 2020, you almost think that uh, Charlie Kaufman Eternal Sunshine himself because he seems like he <laughs> forgot he keeps making these same movies over and over again. And then he made one for Netflix that was like, oh, yeah, Charlie Kaufman seen a Charlie Kaufman movie. Awesome. Um, yeah, Eternal Sunshine, pretty good. Pretty good stuff. I don't know what else to say about it. Uh, I need to rewatch it again. It's been a bit. So my movie, uh, I, I kind of took a similar uh, track to Mike. I mean, a lot of the stuff he was saying in his lead up to Eternal Sunshine kind of fits to what uh, my pick is. Uh, not in the same way. It's not a thriller in its way. It's not a genre film. Um, but it is a movie about a kind of tragic uh, love triangle. 
and about the yearning, aching pain of loving someone from afar, being unable to love them. Uh, it's very much um, uh, set uh, in the, the way this filmmaker is always good at doing, uh, uh, eliciting a time and a place and getting you into the mindset of these people. Uh, one of the most richly realized movies I've ever seen. Uh, one of his most richly realized movies ever uh, he's ever done. Um, it's, uh, just achingly romantic and sad and, uh, just, I think it's one of his best movies. Um, I don't really, uh, it's political in its own ways, but it's not like a war movie or anything like that, but it's got a deep political bent to it. If, if you're willing to pay attention to the movie at hand, instead of just getting distracted by the costumes, it's some of the best work from all, all three of the actors at the center of this, uh, tragic love triangle. Um, my pick is uh, The Age of Innocence by Martin Scorsese. Uh, you know, one of his uh, typical uh, gangster movies. Um, so much <laughs> gunfire in this one. A lot of dead bodies. Uh, I think this movie's fucking great. Uh, I picked it up when the Criterion put it out and uh, the sale was up and I was able to grab it and I watched it and I loved it. I think it's... Um, if you discount Goodfellas, because it was, you know, that was made in 89 and came out in 90, I think this is maybe the best thing he did in the 90s it's either a toss-up between that or bringing out the dead uh i think this movie's fantastic um i think the, the the love story at hand is very tragic gets into a lot of the stuff that like casablanca and eternal sunshine are doing of like you love this person but you can't be with them but like you you're glad you love them but it hurts so much but it takes a more tragic uh turn than either of those two because it is very much about the times being uh one where you can't be with the person you love you have to like worry about your status and your position and like all uh, these arranged fucking relationships and everything um uh I, for as much as I, I feel like daniel day lewis can be dinged for being a little too big for as great as he is he could be very big and in this he's very restrained it's uh this is a fantastic performance from him arguably winona uh, winona ride has never been better uh, this is one of Michelle Pfeiffer's best performances, maybe the best. I like this is one of this is uh, Scorsese's just I mean, he's one of our best for a reason. Uh, one of the this is one of the best examples to throw at morons that say he just makes gangster movies or met movies for men or whatever the fuck uh, clickbait is making the rounds today. Um, I think Adrian is great. I think it would make a great double feature with Casablanca for how it knows to not just do what Casablanca is doing and how to subvert those uh, expectations. Uh, it would also make a good double feature with gangs in New York because, uh, you know, they riot in this people, these people's neighborhoods at the end of gangs of goddamn New York. Um, but I love this movie. I think uh, I'd have to look at my list. I think this is top five Scorsese, which means it's one of the best movies ever made. And uh, I think uh, as much Marty should be in the film registry as possible. And uh, I think this one should be in uh, as soon as possible, as much as quick as they can. This movie rules. Thank you for listening, and thanks to Brian DiLorenzo for joining us. You can watch his new movie, Myth, on Amazon Prime or 2B TV, and you can follow him on social media at Brian DiLorenzo. You can also follow our co-hosts on social media as well. You can find Mike at NKOAS and Tom at RagingBull1990. While you're there, be sure to follow the show on Twitter and Instagram at YMO Podcast. If you like what you heard, don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe. It really helps a little show like ours. If you know some friends who might like the show, tell them about it. And if you have someone you think would make a great guest for an upcoming film, tell us about it at youremissingoutpodcast at gmail.com. Thanks again for listening, and we'll see you again next time. Of all the podcasts on all the platforms in all the world, we're glad you chose ours. <laughs>